Film history is a borderless highway of unknowable complexity. Its roads can travel parallel, perpendicular, and sometimes branch off into nothing but dead ends. Few roads are as strange or as disparate as the one marked Japanese cyberpunk. Famed for their aggression and extremity, these movies, not quite horror, not quite sci-fi, and fully distinct from the traditions of both Western cyberpunk and even most of the cyberpunk pioneered in anime and manga, continue to perplex and horrify viewers in rather visionary and abstruse ways. It's a form that probably comes the closest to rendering cinema as an experience of pure visceral assault, communicating idea and feeling through raw image and sound. The films often feel amateurish, haphazard, yet they display an irregular technical mastery that is staggering in its elaborateness. Directors forego logic and story in favor of the overwhelming power of the moment, a surrender to subconscious and sheer primal emotion. The movement was shockingly small and brief, made up of only a passing handful of true entries. It developed obliquely through a few opaque links between odd, unconventional films by unlikely, self-actuated artists. The only purpose behind it seemed a common disdain for the orthodox rules of filmmaking and a shared desire for unfiltered self-expression. Incredibly, it was never planned or premeditated. There was no manifesto to declare it, no guidebook to show anyone how to do it. As the films found their way out, a movement seemed the only way of explaining their existence. In a way, there was no movement, only a very fortunate series of accidents. Burst City is generally agreed to be the official starting point of the genre. It is a wondrous anomaly in Japanese cinema, a testament to the things that can sometimes happen when the right people are in the right place at the right time. The director was Sogo Ishii, a musician slash filmmaker who leapt into making movies as a teenager. Developing a unique style of wild energy and bombastic visuals, Ishii released his first feature at the age of 21, and only two years later, when he put out his second film, the university graduate project Crazy Thunder Road, distributors at Toei, a major studio, took notice and bought the film for theatrical release. This was something previously unheard of in Japanese cinema. In the late 70s and early 80s, the Japanese film industry was in a period of tremendous crisis and transition. Ticket sales were steadily plummeting at the box office. Studios were producing fewer films each year, and most of the big companies were closing down. The studios that managed to stick around were those that lucked upon a convenient survival method. Toho rallied behind Godzilla, Nikatsu turned to softcore porn, and some recruited the help of outsiders. When Crazy Thunder Road turned a profit, Toei concluded that Ishii must be a valuable attraction for the youth market, so they basically handed him 50 million yen, or about $500,000 and told him to make whatever he wanted. Burst City was what resulted. Perfectly channeling the ennui and frenzied rebellion of contemporary Japanese youth coming of age in the hyper-materialistic 80s, Burst City revolves around a semi-futuristic community of punk rockers, bikers, gangs, and drag racers who band together to fight the police and the Yakuza trying to turn their junkyard haven into a property development. The punk movement was just then erupting across Japan, and Ishii, a punk rocker himself, populated the cast with real-life fellow punks, culled from a few of the most popular bands of the era. The plot, by choice, is only a thin pretense for Ishii to document the look, the sound, and the attitude of this angry electric time in Japanese culture. The runtime is padded with several raucous music performances, captured with turbulent, impulsively mobile handheld cameras, an attempt to translate the dizzying rush of live punk music into a new cinematic grammar. 
The cyberpunk influence is more a side effect of that effort. Ishii's film does not share many of the thematic concerns of later cyberpunk movies. Aesthetically, however, it laid the groundwork. In a quote reprinted in a Mark Player essay included with Arrow Video's amazing new Blu-ray release, Ishii explains that his directing style in those days was indifferent to plot or logic. What he wanted to show was the intensity of moments above all. This quote is helpful in deciphering the sometimes cryptic storytelling of Burst City, but it might as well be describing Japanese cyberpunk itself. Ishii's propulsive editing, astonishing kinetic camera style, and grimy handmade art design, prominently repurposing scrap metal and discarded objects, the detritus of post-industrial society, are obviously a touchstone for the genre. That striking art direction is especially noteworthy. Largely the work of Shigeru Izumiya, a prolific folk rock legend who also co-stars as a main character in the film, Izumiya would take his designs a step further four years after the release of Burst City, and in the process, establish every major thematic obsession of the Japanese cyberpunk genre in a film he wrote and directed himself called Death Powder. Produced for the booming video market that was the latest craze in Japan, Death Powder follows two mercenaries who break into an underground facility and discover an android capable of producing a mind-altering powder. When inhaled, this powder causes hallucinations, mutations of the flesh, and potentially frees the minds of its victims from the confines of the body. Even more so than Burst City, Death Powder abandons conventional plotting in favor of abstract imagery and Lynchian soundscape. Izumiya experiments with the layering technology of video to create bizarre visual effects, and his frequent, abrupt shifts in tone somehow contribute to an unsettling atmosphere of enigmatic horror. Interpreting events in this film might be more difficult than even in the later 964 Pinocchio, but as a hallucinatory expression of ideas, Izumiya's choices result in something disturbing and distinctive. Unlike earlier sci-fi films touching on post-human evolution, such as 2001, which viewed the event with wonder and awe, Death Powder saw the process as agonizing and grotesque. Izumiya seems to be saying that whatever waits on the other side of this evolution is fundamentally inhuman, and therefore unknowable. As ordinary humans ourselves, can we view this process with acceptance or only fear? Does taking the next step in human evolution mean sacrificing our humanity? Could our technology already be actuating the process irreversibly? Cyberpunk does not specialize in answers, only ambiguities. Although Izumiya and Ishii were pioneering something completely new in movies, audiences just weren't ready for it. Death Powder faded into obscurity, and Izumiya doesn't appear to have ever made another film. Burst City was a financial failure, and Ishii mostly left cyberpunk behind, moving into other avenues like concert videos and experimental dramas. In 2000, he released an historical action epic called Gojo, then made a brief return to the aesthetic territory of Burst City, with great, underrated gems like Electric Dragon 80,000 Volts and Dead End Run, before changing his name in 2010 to Gaku Ryu Ishii and evolving his style in other directions. Japanese cyberpunk appeared dead before its time, but appropriately enough, death was not the end. The singular achievements of Ishii and Izumiya would find second life. Fresh ground had opened up for later directors to till and harvest. Death Powder might have been the first real breath of the genre, but Burst City, in its ambition and visibility, would become the beacon, signaling what a young director could achieve when they just went out and did whatever it is they wanted to do. Subsequent filmmakers would follow this philosophy in spirit, if not precisely, in form. <laughs>